All right, I am honored to introduce our second keynote of the night, or of the day, Steve Jurvetson. Um, Steve has been making waves as a businessman and venture capitalist with a keen sense for fostering companies at the forefront of technology. His current board responsibilities include D-Wave, Flux, Mythic, Planet, SpaceX, Synthetic Genomics, and Tesla Motors. He was the founding VC investor in Hotmail, Interwoven, Kana, and Neophotonics. Earlier this month, Steve received the Visionary Award from SV Forum for his central role in promoting the spirit of entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. Uh, now let's give it up for Steve. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. I was downloading some material. Sorry about that. Great. Ah, oh, good. And there's a slide clicker. Sorry for the delay. San Francisco traffic uh, conspired against me. There's a speaker as I speak. It, it's on. Is that supposed to be? Wow. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's a, I have to overcome that echo. Um, if I can get away from it. How about unplugging it? Wouldn't that be smarter? Just to unplug the speaker? Or on this TV? Like, have you ever been on a phone call where you hear your own voice slightly delayed? I'm too loud. <laughs> I have to over, but if I speak louder, then I have to overcome my own. Probably just the television. Yeah. I would. Just, just a moment. If, if this works, I think every speaker will be happier. Oh, totally. Yeah. Worst case, you could turn the power off for me because I don't mind having. To maybe, maybe we have to do this. Okay. You know, I'll see if the uh, slide clicker works. This one's not advancing. Cool, thank you. Um, is there a way to make this advance, the slides? Or get to the slides? Ah, that's cool. That's not me, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was art from, uh, obviously, Rogue One. I think it was Rogue One or those Star Wars before it. Oh, cool, that looks like me. Excellent. Well, um, sorry again for uh, the preamble. Um, but yes, what I want to try to share with you today is some of our excitement for some of the new frontiers and new spaces, we like to call it, and of course with the Space Frontier Foundation, what a perfect tie-in, um, in that I think we all know in our hearts there's a visceral rise in excitement and enthusiasm for the space sector again. And without debating what new space versus not new space means, just the fact that there's something new going on all around us is uh, undeniable. Uh, and it's doubly exciting when new entrants enter the picture because that makes the whole ecosystem more competitive, more interesting. It's certainly something we look for as investors in startups is, is there an opportunity for a new entrant, right? And if it's business as usual, the big get bigger, stasis, predictability, monopolistic practices, this is not a very exciting industry for young people to join when they're coming out of college. It's not uh, motivating for some of the best and the brightest. And I think we all know that's changed dramatically just in the last 10 years. So what I want to try to do is share some of that enthusiasm with you. Um, to start the discussion, what I often like to do is ask the, the hypothetical question, why do new entrants ever have a chance? More abstractly, so stepping just for a moment outside the space industry, but I'll come right back to it um, in a moment. Why and when would a new entrant ever have a chance against a larger incumbent? A larger company has a brand position, it has customer relationships, it has money, it has a lot going for it. It presumably has a larger R&D budget. So why is it that we take for granted, especially here in Silicon Valley, that new entrants time and time again lead all the meaningful change? And, and let me say that again, all of the meaningful change in every industry forever, right? It is never an incumbent who makes history sort of um, worthy accomplishments in their core business once they're a big company. So when, let me just unpack that for a minute. So even Apple today in computing, Google in search, Hewlett Packard just a few years ago, when they were thought of as an innovative company, it's when they entered a business they weren't currently in, getting into the printing business from the computing business. A large company never leads the charge in their core business when it comes to radical change, disruptive change, what I might call meaningful change. Because if it's incrementalism, a little 5% improvement in the business process anywhere in a large company, it's important, billions of dollars may ensue, but it's really not something anyone will remember 30 years from now. It won't be the thing that pushes us forward let's say, to become a spacefaring nation, or a spacefaring uh, uh, species, rather. 
Okay, so how is it that this happens over and over again? There's one um, curve I want to show you that I think it epitomizes where, why we see disruptive change. But before I show it, I just want to ask how many people have seen this before? So then I can, I can adjust accordingly. This will be Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law, the 120 year version of Moore's Law, and uh, dare I say, anyone who's ever seen me speak before would have seen it, just as a reminder, because I show it in every presentation I've ever given for like 20 years now, <laughs> regardless of topic. Because I think it's the most important thing ever graphed. By, by the way, I think I saw more hands than almost ever. Um, normally I get about 20% of the hands up, I think it was like 45. Um, so I'll be a little quicker in explaining what it is. The access is how much computational power can you buy per dollar? So it's independent of transistor counts. It's not what Gordon Moore said, but it's really what he meant and really what matters to the consumers today. You don't buy transistors, no one does. You buy computational power or storage, and you can plot either one, you get a similar curve. And you have over 120 years of data along the line here. You have some technology epochs. Each band is a different technology substrate that was sort of the dominant substrate of the day. They are, as you know, from mechanical devices to the integrated circuit. So what I'm going to show you has nothing to do with Intel at all. It has nothing to do with Gordon Moore's observation, which was frankly a refraction of a longer term trend. Uh, and it tells an amazing story. So as many of you know, punchline is this is a logarithmic scale on the, on the um, y axis, meaning each of those lines, as you can tell, is a hundredfold gap, right? So this is a geometric kind of curve. A straight line would be an exponential, slightly upticking by the best curve fit seems to be a double exponential curve, holding over 120 years. I don't know if there's anything else in technology business that has been this predictable, right? Anything you could hang your hat on for the next 20 years in your business modeling, in your planning, in thinking about what you might put on a satellite versus what you might not be able to put on a satellite computationally, right? There's a lot of things we're gonna draw from this curve in, over the next few moments, but the main thing is, wow, like almost philosophically or cosmologically, what is going on here, right? And how does this so exogenous to the economy, right? World War I, World War II, Great Depression, having no impact on this. In fact, let me label some of the computers. And this is um, more updated than anything else that's been published because we've added all of the NVIDIA data points in conjunction with uh, Ray Kurzweil, including the uh, Titan X that I bought my son for Christmas gift, $1,200, has more tele tera ops than anything else you could buy anywhere for five years ago. And in fact, over the last 10 years, it's NVIDIA that has been leading the charge. It has a baton, not Intel. So Intel's lost in a sense, the voice of authority and what Moore's Law is. And I wouldn't pay any attention to anything they say about Moore's Law coming to an end. Just ask NVIDIA and ask other companies. That's where the future keeps going to someone new and Intel doesn't want you to believe that because they want to believe they are somehow and the CPU is somehow what it's all about. But that's long, long since not been the case. In fact, there's more computation going on in Bitcoin mining than there is in all CPUs on Earth, right? So everything Intel's ever done is dwarfed by Bitcoin mining ASICs alone. We don't show those on here because they're special purpose computers, but still, it's just, Anyway, so the uh, other thing that's important I think in this curve is throughout technology history, what happens is when Moore's Law gets to a certain threshold, you can do something in a simulation that you couldn't before, right? There were things that were trial and error experimentation, like the way Boeing would use wind tunnels in aircraft design, pretty standard process. Now most of those wind tunnels that are, let's say, at NASA Ames lie fallow, rarely used for some supersonic sort of parachute testing stuff in a Martian atmosphere uh, simulation, but generally for aircraft design, you don't need Wind tunnels, because computational design has reached a threshold where it's just better. Same is true for uh, crash test safety for Tesla and other cars companies. They don't need to use the crash test dummies for anything other than the final government test. It's still a requirement, right? You know you're going to pass the test before you run it. In fact, the reason SpaceX's first flights worked on the Falcon 9 or the reusability that now we know works, but they knew worked the very first time hovering over the ocean but not having a boat underneath it was because of simulation, because of the test rigs that they use, laying out all the sensors, in a sense, putting them in a matrix where the rocket thinks it's flying, but it's not, testing hundreds of millions of billions of test cases before flying the first time. The same is happening in autonomous driving today. Literally billions approaching trillions of miles are put onto these vehicles before they ever hit the road, literally in game simulators derived from Grand Theft Auto. They get that realistic that you can test all kinds of weird corner cases, like someone jumps the curb and is gonna hit you head on, or who knows what else from Grand Theft Auto you might wanna test, but you're gonna be ready for the zombie apocalypse, I believe, um, in all these simulations. So, but back to, back, back to serious topics. This, I think, has been a perpetual driver of disruption. For some reason, business planners can't seem to plot things on log-log paper or semi-log paper, and so they just keep getting surprised. Whether it's Sony losing the Walkman franchise, or one, it just shouldn't seem this way, but it is. No human in a business process seems to take this into serious account in making business futures, whereas a lot of startups do. They'll just look at the next chip that's coming down the pipe or what have you. Another derivative conclusion of this that's really important, I think, to the space industry 
is that if you use space qualified hardware with flight proven trajectories or history in your electronic side, in your computational side, in your information technology side of your product, be it a satellite or a rocket, and you wait 10 years, either because you're using older products or you want your satellite to have a 20 year life and so on average they're up there for 10 years, um, you know, average point halfway through their life, <clears throat> a 10 year gap when you're doubling every year is to the 10th, that's 1,000 X. So company A using today's off the shelf silicon competing with company B using 10 year old silicon in any context has a thousand fold advantage without even being smart about anything, right? If you look at the Curiosity rover currently roving on Mars, it is a two megapixel camera. Right, this incredible accomplishment. I was at JPL watching it land with the sky crane and all that. Two megapixel camera because it was a 2004 design freeze. That's a traditional modality of how you get there, right? When it comes to the physical stuff in a satellite or a rover or a spacecraft, you may want rad hard this and space proven that. But when it comes to the computational element, you face an enormous disadvantage if you don't use commercial off the shelf parts. Now, why is this? <laughs> I love this quote from Matt Ridley. Uh, there were actually three different books that all came out in the same year, 2012, that all made the same argument, interestingly and almost humorously, that every good idea happens at the same time, usually within months of each other. And it's funny that three books making the same argument came out in the same year. Um, things like Nikola Tesla and Edison and Marconi having about the same ideas around the same time, and in fact it was Tesla that invented radio, not Marconi, because we just didn't realize how close some of these people were in having the same idea using the precursor ideas of the past. The, the simple idea is every breakthrough, everything that is fundamentally a patentable invention or a breakthrough idea, be it a product or a process, is a recombination of prior ideas. So you can think about idea space, and we're all vectors for ideas between each other. It's a combinatorial explosion. It goes the, right, by Reed's law in a two to the end combinatorial explosion of how many possible recombination of ideas you can have from a given set of N ideas. This sort of explains why you have this exponential progress in information technologies, in knowledge, in data. We could plot all these things, as Ray Kurzweil does. You see these peculiar exponential curves. And I think one reason simply for that is the combinatorial explosion of possible recombination ideas. This is why interdisciplinary studies are so powerful at universities usually, why big breakthrough ideas tend to come from folks out of left field, not folks in the center of the herd, why the internet has compounded productivity and innovativeness and entrepreneurship, and why, frankly, weird little things like the average person is more inventive when they live in a city than when they don't live in a city. Again, think of us as vectors of ideas having sex or mating with each other, kind of like a mimetic extension of the genetic selfish gene that Dawkins wrote about. Okay, now, as I mentioned, there's all these thresholds where Moore's Law breaks through something moving from a trial and error experimentative science into a simulation science, and the pace of progress explodes, right, moving from atoms to bits, if you will. And these are just some of the examples, six sectors that we've been actively investing in over the last 10 years that are radically going through change because of this. And we're gonna talk only about, about the space one today, but just as, as an aside, everything I might say about how Planet Labs did what they did applies to Tesla. It applies to some of the, strangely enough, the agricultural companies and synthetic meat companies that you'll see out there, the companies that are doing innovative work in robots, the ones that are frankly generating meaningful change in, in many different industries. And so, but we'll just talk about space today. SpaceX, well, we know it well. I'm not gonna uh, belabor the obvious here. Let me just say something new about them. Not new, say something uh, in terms of background, then something new. Um, some of you may have seen this before, but it still just strikes me as kind of amazing, and we should keep in mind that if you look at the blue, dark blue lines, on the far left, 1980, the United States had a 100% market share of commercial satellite launch, right? And then the three years prior to SpaceX entering the market with the Falcon 9, uh, it was zero went from 100 to zero, meaning even U.S. companies, when they had a choice, did not want to fly in a U.S. rocket. It was not cost competitive for anything, right? So the incumbents prior to SpaceX were not cost effective when one had a choice. Of course, military launches don't have a choice, so they're not shown here, just commercial. This is where you have a free market, or almost free market, as you know. There's some, there are obviously some limitations between certain countries uh, flying on each other's rockets. Um, that's radically changing again, and I think that's part of the excitement, again, is that you have you know, you don't show the, the actual total opportunities at all 100% bars, but you have, frankly, competition. And you know more is coming. Uh, Rocket Lab and, and, and Blue Origin and a bunch of others who are, you know, uh, going to be um, participants in this as well. Now, one of the reasons, uh, and in my personal point of view, and I should caveat, I probably should have said this earlier, everything I'm going to share is my personal point of view as an investor and board member in these companies, but not an official party line from any one of them per se. So my opinion on why SpaceX 
is so different from all the other companies with which it competes is that it has a mission that is unlike all of its competitors. Initially, it was almost laughable, right? It was hard to say we're gonna colonize Mars, right? Not just one, not just be the first to land on Mars, not just bring humans to Mars on a commercial and private uh, sort of, of trajectory, but to put millions of people on Mars, right? Today, it doesn't generate a snicker. Five, 10 years ago, that was easily dismissed by the incumbents. Like, that's crazy talk, right? If you're one of the ones currently lofting Geo or Leo birds into orbit as your primary business, this is way off your radar screen. This is not something you're spending significant resources on. This is not something you're gonna bet the company on, right? And there's so many things SpaceX is doing that were driven by the Mars mission, like propulsive landing, uh, instead of, well, for a number of reasons, reusability. If you wanna get back from Mars and, you know, not that, have it be a one-way trip, you dramatically change the total cost of becoming a multi-planetary species, you gotta get the rocket back. You have to be able to refill and re refuel and reuse. And so an incredible investment, which Elon estimated at over a billion dollars of R&D dollars to get reusability of the booster, you can see now why on a mission to Mars that makes sense if all you're doing is competing with other monopoly kind of providers globally to loft military satellites as your primary focus in life, you would never go down this path, right? And so you don't explore the breakthroughs if you're not on a dramatic mission to change the world or frankly change other worlds, right? And it's that star on the horizon that that mission that not only sort of percolates back to a chain forward of capabilities like methane as a, as a, um, um, as a fuel instead of kerosene, because again, on Mars, you're not gonna assume you're gonna uh, have fossil fuels for obvious reasons, nor would it be easy to make them, but methane's easy to extract from a Martian um, in-situ resource pool. That kind of investment makes sense now, right? But you also motivate your employees. You also get a lot of excitement from partners, the government and otherwise, that want you to succeed in your mission. Right? And I've seen this happen at Tesla, I've seen this happen at SpaceX and at Planet. It is a wonderful thing when all of your employees come to work excited about the mission and all of your customers want you to succeed as do your partners. That's, I think, increasingly the thing I want to invest in and I look for in every investment that I make. And of course, Buzz Aldrin in the bottom right, he's, a, he's been a fan for a while too, he's, he cracks me up. Oh, let me just uh, actually go back. Uh, some of you may know this, but that photo in the bottom center, it has been for years now, probably almost a decade, been uh, at the entrance to SpaceX headquarters, just inside the security door, so every employee walks by it. It shows Mars and Mars terraformed, and these are, as you can see from the woman for scale, quite large um, prints, and that's been there from the founding um, days. Or at least the Mars one, they added the terraformed one a little more recently. Okay, so a quick segue, because uh, it's a fun story and I just love it. Um, I love to launch rockets as a hobby. So I'm actually a space freak in various ways. I collect space artifacts. I converted the entire DFJ office into a space museum of Apollo era and earlier artifacts. And anytime you're in the area near Sand Hill Road, feel free to stop by. You don't need an appointment. And it's like on display. I have a piece of every lunar module that's been to the moon, which takes a little thinking how do these things even exist on Earth, a registered part of each spacecraft, and a bunch of other cool stuff. The largest slice of the moon on Earth, the second largest Martian meteorite on Earth. Anyway, so I also launched rockets. I've been doing this for like 14 years with my son out in the Black Rock Desert. This is a, a company, uh, an engine out of uh, Cesarone Aerospace in Canada, which makes cruise missile boosters, uh, solid boosters to get cruise missiles going. And this actually is just a spare that we launched uh, in this fiberglass rocket. It's a lot of fun, but a few years ago, I met this peculiar team from, I couldn't tell if they're from Google, NASA, or both, talking and blathering on about phones, the average HTC Android phone of the day, having more compute and memory than any satellite in orbit just this phone in their hand. And they were, as some of you might know, the precursors of what became the PhoneSat project. And we were trying to do some G-load testing in the rocket, it actually came back ballistic and drilled down into the playa, so it was quite a G-load test. But the data survived, and it was, for their purposes, a successful test. Um, that team, Will Marshall, Chris Bojan, and, and lady, later Rob, Robbie from the East Coast NASA uh, facility, went ahead and launched uh, Alexander, Graham, and Bell, the three PhoneSats, and then went off to spin off, you know, after I sort of brainstormed with them for over a year before they formed actually a garage spin out. I love it when you actually start a company in a garage, um, more than just making the garage start of a metaphor, but starting it there, this was the early days of where Planet started. And as, as many of you know, um, that this used to be kind of an amazing thing to show, their first satellite, not a model, but the actual thing, uh, given size, but you all know that now, and the flock of doves as you know it. I was gonna add, but I just couldn't get the internet here to work fast enough, the, you know, the incredible video um, from the Indian Space Agency, or ISRO, of this just spewage of 88 satellites just falling out one after the other. Hopefully you've all seen that. 
I wanted to show it to you today. You can find it online easily. It's something I don't think anyone's ever seen before, you know, the actual live deployment of an entire constellation like that. But these smaller ones in the ISS, you know, have been percolating around for a few years. Now, as some of you know, and I'm gonna try to draw some conclusions from the planet experience, it's an emblematic of many of the things we're looking for in, quote, new space companies. And that is, um, first, in this particular case, you take a very different approach to the existing market. Instead of tasking a satellite, knowing in advance what you want eyes on, is it Kuwait or Afghanistan, if each pass, you just raster scan the whole planet. Totally changes the business model and sales and the ability to do opportunistic open source providing of data and discovering apps on top of your ecosystem. It also means you can do all kinds of things. I'll show you with some images um, that are different from the existing business. But what we like is not that you have to hope that a whole new industry forms that doesn't exist today. The goal in investing in Planet was day one, you just sell to everyone who currently buys satellite imagery, albeit not the highest resolution, but you've got a much cheaper solution for the existing market, so you don't have to worry about when business starts. In fact, they, they booked more revenue at every point of their existence through the present day than they raised from, in, from outside investors. So take all the venture capital and the angel investing and everything, because we were, and we were there from the very beginning, at every point along the way, they had more bookings from customers pre-paying or pre-signing contracts than they had raised from outside investors. That's also a good sign that the market is big. Oh, interesting, this uh, jumped ahead. That's fine. Um, and uh, they, um, oh, right, but then there's all the new stuff. The reason we invested wasn't just because they do something that's already being done a little bit better, it's that they can get the daily cadence, imaging the whole Earth every day, every meter, as you know. And that also then p builds a historical archive where you can do differential uh, tests. You can see, like, did something just change? And when it comes to natu natu uh, natural disasters, you usually don't have a before image because it just wasn't interesting, like Fukushima. Who would be imaging Fukushima before it had something happen, right? So it's nice to have a before and after, especially for NGOs. You can, and this is, uh, this is not the Terrabella imagery. This is all the, you know, the, the three U CubeSat imagery. To be able to monitor, you know, refinery, tank, um, you know, the floating lids and how much inventory there is in each, in each of these, and then with synthetic aperture radar, look through clouds and do it at Singapore and, you know, where they have cloud cover a lot or at night is also nice, uh, just for a lot of business things. You can, of course, see, you know, natural events as they occur. Um, you can see all, they have all kinds of, you go to the Twitter account, all kinds of examples of looking at refugee camps and as they grow. So, of course, it's just starting, but the, you know, journalistic opportunities are amazing. If you just want eyes on something or you want, you know, ground truth and transparency around war zones or, or um, uh, you know, or refugee camps, just to get a sense of what's happening. Uh, or, or, of course, national, uh, national things, uh, sort of natural things as well, like reservoir depths globally. Um, you can count every car in every parking lot daily. You can, um, as one European startup showed, building off this data set, um, get a better read on new housing starts than any other data set that currently exists. Because uh, you can tell if something's being the precursor of construction, just in general. You train a neural network on that, and, oh, that's another key point. When you have this much data, it's just overwhelming for normal human analysis. What you want, of course, is a deep learning network that looks for examples like something else. So just train it on thousands of examples of new housing starts, then run that algorithm globally, and it just finds them all for you without a human intervention. That's, that's key to the cost position on all this. And other companies, of course, like Mapbox and Descartes Labs and others are making that a business in and of themselves, just trying to build that data layer or that neural network layer. But over time, I think it'll be somewhat ubiquitous, that that's the way we would process this tsunami of data. Um, I won't talk too much about Terabella, um, other than it's, well, maybe I'll just mention one thing. It's perhaps obvious that one of the cool things you can do when you have both daily, lower resolution imaging of the whole planet, and then a bunch of birds that can do the high resolution stuff, is you can do automated tip and cue. Find, through an algorithm, ah, something changed. Something just blew up, let's say in a war zone, or a boat's not where it's supposed to be, or, you know, because it hasn't actually registered. Um, with the maritime systems, and what is that boat that's not on the maritime system? Do the high res, you know, zoom in um, with the low res as your sort of automated discovery engine. So that's what I think of as the original planet business is discovery, change detection, and ubiquitous daily coverage. This allows you to do all kinds of things you couldn't do before. Oh, sorry, let me go back. What, the reason I showed this was just other companies like Mapbox and Unity, which our growth fund has invested in both of them, can integrate and put three-dimensional wire mesh models like you do in the gaming world to, with now the, the satellite imagery as it comes through and whether it's, you know, who knows what applications. It's something as simple as a flight simulator could be much more up-to-date and current with, with real imagery in this way because it creates a 3D model. Okay, so just the summary on Planet and then I'll wrap up. So basically what Planet has showed, I think, is that you can do a lot in low Earth orbit and geo if you have cheaper access to space. In many ways, SpaceX started the thought experiment and the belief amongst investors and entrepreneurs that the future might be cheaper than the past. 
and the fact that you could look up everyday low pricing on, online, right? Like, the, that SpaceX was the first, and for a long time, the only company that listed its prices online, meant that if you're an entrepreneur in the satellite business, you don't have to be like an industry insider to know what actually gets negotiated in dark rooms that are, you know, not visible to others for pricing and for business model planning. Now it's open. I can't tell you what a boom that was in business plans. In fact, here's a generalization, or not or just a summary, rather, is that prior to our SpaceX investment, and prior to SpaceX sort of entering the scene, there wasn't a single space entrepreneurial business plan that I thought warranted bringing to my partnership. In other words, being such a space nut as I am, and a rocket enthusiast, not one proposal sort of met my generic filters for what I think warrants a business meeting with the team. Post SpaceX, are just tons of them. They're all over the place. It's like night and day. And a big part of it is they, they don't want to be experts in launch. They want to be experts in whatever it is they're doing, be it some new imaging technology or what have you, even tourism. So in the case now, back to Planet, the running simulations, right, they did all kinds of interesting ways of testing their satellites terrestrially before flying the first one. So the very first one, the very first attempt to take an image, it was a perfectly awesome image in the, in the Washington area. It's still my favorite. It's like, wow, first light, first satellite worked first time. And so have most of the things that they've uh, introduced as new capabilities over time. Because they fly a lot more than what is publicly announced. Um, using commodity off-the-shelf parts, still to this day, there isn't a single part in a planet satellite that isn't just available off the shelf. That gives them the huge, more, huge Moore's Law advantage. Dematerialization of value. I think this is, back when I showed all those different industries, robots, cars, satellites, rockets, you know, all these industries affected by Moore's Law, this is a general thing, that you take a big, heavy, industrial, crappy, low-growth margin business and you make it an information-rich business, and it totally changes. That's what's happening in cars right now. The future car company winners are going to be the best AIs. Not the best engines, not the best design, not the best wheels or other, th it's, it's, it's a software product now and not many in the automotive industry realize that. Same is true in the, in, the, in the launch business. And by the way, when you go through these profound changes, especially in industries where they haven't seen a new entrant for like 20, 25 years, the competitive response is kind of unbelievable. It's pretty much to give up. SpaceX's competitors in the launch business initially just were in denial. Like the Chinese minister said, we can't compete on price. When do you ever hear that from China on a manufacturing business? We can't compete on price. Even if we had Western technology, all of it. Like even if we had all the raw components that SpaceX has, we could not launch rockets for the same price they do. They said that out of the chute because they thought SpaceX was dumping. They thought that they were lying about their online price list, right? Similarly, U.S. companies pretty much had the competitive response of giving up. It's like, government, we need billions of dollars because otherwise we're just going to have to shut down our programs. That's the competitive response, right? The automotive industry isn't quite there yet, right? There's a variety of reasons. The penetration rate of electric versus gas drivetrains is, has a variety of reasons why it's slow, and there's 18-year average lifetime of these vehicles on the road. So it's a slower-moving death march, but it's a similar thing, right? It's just incredibly hard for companies who have no software talent to suddenly pivot to become software-centric businesses. And that's what we're all seeing in all the other ones that we're not talking about today, you know, the, the reason we invest in certain companies in robotics, agriculture, and what have you. And the dematerialization, one way to just visually remember it is just think of the iPhone today. You know that the next phone, from whatever you are, Android platform or, or Apple, is going to look just like the one you have in your pocket today, right? You remember, right, we all do, just 10, 15, 20 years ago, the next physical thing mattered. It was, a, was it the little thing from Motorola or Sony or this or the flip phone? The physical thing actually mattered, the design of it, the, the box. And now, other than knowing that the processor, of course, gets better, the imager, of course, gets better, both driven by Moore's Law, it's always the same thing. The thing is the same. All it is is a gateway to software and services, right? It's just the minimal vessel for code. And that's what all these physical products are becoming, from robots to satellites to rockets. They're vessels for code. It, it, if you ask Elon Musk and people have, well, how do you compete? Why will you compete 10 years in the future? Let's say on the Tesla side, his answer is it's all about the software. That's why we'll keep winning. It's nothing to do with electric motors or battery technology or any of that. Of course, serving global markets in what Planet calls the agile, agile airspace. But I'm going I'm to finish this up. So the last example that I love, um, I'll just mention two brief ones and then be done, actually. Uh, I call it Skynet just because I like the cheeky name. Um, you know, putting up thousands of satellites through broadband data. Imagine gigabit links down to $200 base stations. Companies like OneWeb and Boeing and SpaceX and others have all announced the intent to do things. And all kinds of new, all kinds of new entrants in all different areas of the spectral band from KA up to shoot, V-band and L-band, all kinds of stuff, are, um, are you know, making ITU filings in this area. What I think is really important, for, even for the non-space side of the internet sector, is to just bet on this happening, right, by 2020, 2021 at the latest, by more than one company. 
And what that means globally is kind of spectacular. We're going to go from two to six billion people connected and online faster than most people are forecasting outside of the space sector. When you think about how does space interface with other parts of the global economy, this is going to be like unlike anything we've ever seen before. I don't know if there's any historical precedent from like of such a change. We have four billion people who, for all intents and purposes, are decoupled from the global economy. In other words, they buy some Procter and Gamble and, and Unilever product but they generally don't interface online, because they're not online, with any of what we consider the global economy. Their inventions, their ideas, their entrepreneurial urges, their mimetic foment, if you will, is lost in these little pockets all around the world. And that's gonna triple, the, the, this technology alone will triple the online population within 10 years. That, let that sink in, that is unbelievable. And important, of course, thing we always look for in new investments and new things is that we always ask, why now? Is there any reason this could have been done five years ago? Is there any reason Teledesic or other attempts should have worked and this didn't? And of course, the phase array antennas and the semiconductors, high-speed you know, amplifiers and others that we now have. Like I, worked, I used to design high-speed amplifiers back at Hewlett Packard with an F of T of just you know, like 10 gigahertz or so, and it's like way the hell up there, like 200 now. This is basically how, how fast of a high-power transistor can you make these discrete. This unlocks the phase array antennas that make the ground stations 200 bucks. If it weren't for that, you'd have moving parts and tracking things, it just wouldn't work. There's just no physical way around this challenge, as you know, is the moment you move in from geo, you're moving, as a, the, the, the physics is never gonna change, so therefore you have to track if you're gonna use communications for lower Earth satellites. It used to be that meant moving parts. That used to be cost ineffective. It destroyed the business model. Phase array antennas now enable all these things to happen. That's why now. And many of these parts weren't available until actually in some cases just last year. This is what um, uh, OneWeb's ground terminal, at least one of the versions they've been showing recently, looks like, as well as the satellite in the background, um, or in the upper right corner. These are just some photos they took at a conference, so in case you're wondering what they're still working on, and they think, still think that's a $200 part with you know, LTE chipset built in because of the partnership with Qualcomm and all that, so you just light up a village. You could toss a pizza box-like version on a roof. So when I talk about $200, that means the solar panel, too, right? The entire solution for lighting up a village, let's say, in Africa for 200 bucks um, um, would fit in that budget. I don't think I'll talk about B612 because I'm running out of time, but it's neat that the nonprofit world is also thinking about uh, clusters of satellites and um, synthetic tracking across a constellation of small sats. The, their initial design was this one, a single large bird flying near Venus orbit. Now they realize they can do it with a constellation of smaller satellites that operating in Federation at, again, way more than 10, maybe even 100x lower cost. So I love that for, back, back when this was the larger bird and I've been a donor to this, full disclosure, it costs less than new wing of the Asian Art Museum here in San Francisco to protect all of the artifacts on Earth for the next 100 years, right? So for comparable price of one wing of one art museum, you could detect all near Earth objects that could possibly threaten life on Earth or at least city level destruction and above. Um, and yet, we're not yet funded, funded, funded in that project. I encourage you all to do that, take a look at it. So my, my last slide, just wrapping up. Um, is I think that we are in an era of accelerating technological change. Moore's Law is sort of like that visual, emblematic example of that. But that's not gonna change. Um, this photo I took of a black swan sort of drinking from the fire hose, I think is emblematic of the future we're gonna live in, which is increasing change, increasing disruption. The lifespan of any, any given product or company will continue to shrink. The rate at which we are surprised by things we, quote, have never seen before, whether it's a financial collapse or what have you, should just continue to accelerate, and that is, it, peculiarly dissettling for anyone who's trying to rest on one's laurels or sit on an existing business forever, but it's wonderful for new entrants, whether those new entrants are companies, people launching in new areas in their careers, even small countries have a better opportunity than they ever had before to compete against large countries. So it's at all fractal scales that disruption is good for the new entrant, it's good for innovation, and it's good for progress. Uh, it's kind of like the evolutionary foment has been turned up a notch. And I think that, therefore, is a good time for startups in the new space industry and for um, all the things that will excite us and make our childhood dreams come true. Thank you. And I, don't, I think I went over, so I don't think I have time for questions, right? Because I'm, I'm happy to do questions, but I went over a little bit, so, you know. If anyone wants to, sure. I have these bright lights on me, so I have to do this. If, uh, oh, there's one, yeah. You wanna? <laughs> I'm not going to tell anything they haven't announced other than, in, 
so let me, let me, okay, so the question for anyone who didn't hear it is, how do I square um, the lowering of the cost of access to space with the collapse of many of the traditional um, um, data com and, 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 and basically the geobirds, um, the large public companies that you hear about? How do the, you square that? And then also, uh, oh shoot, the second one, are there any unannounced you know, commercial contracts that, that I'd like to announce today? So no, but um, the, uh, as you know, they just did two launches in the, uh, we, over the weekend, and so they're showing the operational capacity to do a cadence that uh, you'd want to see. Um, even my son driving him to, to work today, um, he's young, but he works, which is wonderful, uh, was like, wow, how many boosters does SpaceX have in inventory if they just keep getting them back? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> And when do you have enough, you know, obviously certain customers don't want to fly on the, what I, what I, by the way, I coined the term flight proven instead of used. So when the term used first came up, I'm like, no, no, never use the word used. Flight proven, who'd want to be on the very first flight of an airplane, right? And there's obviously some differences, but, and I digress, but I think flight proven is a wonderful term and eventually may command a higher price than a new flight vehicle um, once the th statistics bear that out. Um, okay, so uh, there are, over $10 billion of revenue under contract and backlog and, and such. And that's um, still the case at SpaceX. It's, you know, just keeps growing. Um, but I'm not gonna obviously announce new things. So there's plenty of business. So I think the quick answer to your first question is people anticipate some shifts, right? The future belongs to broadband, right? If you think of today, everything, oh, I mean broadband over IP, is, uh, I should say. So you think of today, um, there are a variety of things we've invested in like Hotmail was my first investment, right? It's a free web-based email. Unbelievably, prior to that, in 96 timeframe, people paid extra money to get email as a service. In other words, you had an ISP, you paid for web access, and you paid for an email account, like five bucks per account. Like, like it was so long ago and so archaic. It's like, what? Email's just an application. It just runs over an IP network. You would never pay for email. You just pay for a data link. As we know with you know, video over the top and Netflix customers and such, many young people think of it that way today. It's like, you wouldn't pay a separate bill to a video provider, why would you ever do that? So things like text, voice, Skype and other investments we've been making, video, everything that's data is gonna run over an IP network. It's not gonna have a dedicated pipe, right? And so, yes, this will take decades to play out, but that's the ultimate end game without anybody doubting it, and so some might look at the existing businesses and say, you know, I don't know if that's a good business to be in a proprietary pipe, you know, especially a bent pipe analog transponder in geo just doesn't feel like an exciting business. Now again, this is me speaking, let me be really clear, as a venture investor, this is not with, with the SpaceX hat on, they just launch anything and everything, they're happy. The market, so another way to look at your a question from a SpaceX perspective is the total number of launch opportunities keeps growing, right, it's not shrinking, despite shifts that may be happening. They're, they are forecasting nothing but growth for many, many years in the launch business. Um, when I'm speaking, no, going back to where I was being, speaking as an investor, I'd be like, I would expect profound shifts. Um, and some companies will make a shift to new modern architectures and others won't. Um, and that's what you would hope would happen, right? It would be a really weird world if for many, many decades, one analog technology basically held the day for you know, about the entire period without change. Um, I think there's another question. No, I can think that. I think that was both questions. Oh shoot, there's others. Yeah. We're gonna take two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry about sorry about being too verbose in some of those answers. I'll try to be quicker. Okay. So yeah, I have. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes, I'm on staff, but I'm yeah. also asking a question. So what are we gonna do? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, you guys go ahead. I'll, maybe I'll come ask you my thing later. Sure. Afterwards, I'm happy. To, I'll, I'll be around afterwards. I'm not running away, so I'll, yeah. I can. Yeah. Phil Swan from the Alliance Project. You mentioned that there were criteria that weren't being met by the industry and therefore you couldn't take ideas to your partners um, a few years ago and now these, the industry's advanced to the point where now you can bring ideas to your partners because these criteria are being met. Could you talk a little bit more about what those criteria are in your mind oh. and, and why the industry is now able to satisfy them? Right, so uh, I had a hard time hearing but I think I got it and tell me if I got it wrong. At that point about Prior to SpaceX, not bringing deals to the partnership, now there's lots. What were the criteria I'm using and why is it so different today? Yeah. Right? Okay. So there are some things that don't change. You want a passionate entrepreneur who's really bright and adaptive and has a dream for how to change the world and you, you get this infectious enthusiasm then they can convince you of it. So that doesn't change and they're just, sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. But um, 
but there needs to be more. So to specifically, what seemed to change? The first was just whether the business case would close regarding capital intensity. So we, as an early stage investor, don't like to write $100 million checks. We never have. Uh, in fact, $10 million checks, we generally only write when we feel pretty good that some of the risks have been resolved. And when it's a normal garage startup like Planet was, it's low single digit millions that we're comfortable. And this is true in general across the early stage venture business. And there are some notable exceptions, which always catch our eyes, but generally speaking, that's a rough rule of thumb. So if somebody has a proposal where it takes hundreds of millions of dollars before they know if the customer even wants the product or service, or there isn't a customer identified, or they need, here's the, here was usually the other killing, uh, killer factor uh, in those early days, is that you needed someone else to do something before you even have a business. Take, for example, fuel depots in space as a startup idea. In the long run, that makes a lot of sense. Right now, even if you could just wish it into being, who's going to use it, right? Unless you've got already and been evangelizing over many years, let's say a government or other deep space mission, what is the use of the fuel depot in space today, right? Uh, if you're gonna refuel satellites in orbit for extension of life, sure, sure you, can, you can talk about all these opportunities, but if you're not gonna do the entire solution, then you're waiting on others, and if those others are the traditional, dare I say, aerospace slash military industrial complex kind of timeframes and cost positions, it's just, your potential as an innovator is dramatically reduced. So we tried to only invest in things where, like take Planet Labs for example, they didn't need someone else to invent a better ground station to do downlinks. They didn't need anything to change in the launch ecosystem. In fact, they didn't even need SpaceX to exist for them to hitch rides with nanoracks and others to station and to make their trial, because of their satellite size, to make the um, piggybacking opportunities to test satellites in space cost effective to then eventually feel confident about the Constellation deployment later. So in a long-winded way, what I'm trying to say is capital intensity, um, the, the ability because of, frankly, Moore's law, to envision an entire product that's much cheaper than ever before. So in the case of both SpaceX and Planet Labs, they can make an argument that they're more than 100x cheaper than the incumbents. In the case of Planet Labs, you could even get close to 10,000x, if, if, but not on an apples to apples basis. If you take Constellation versus single satellite, which is more apples to apples, you're still well more than 100x, maybe even 1,000x cheaper. I don't see that anywhere else in business. I mean, that, that sort of aha sometimes takes the collective wisdom and intelligence of many entrepreneurs looking at the domain that wasn't our expertise area. Like, I couldn't have told you prior to Planet Labs what the average satellite cost in that sector, what the opportunities were. I'm not the kind of person who would come up with the entrepreneurial idea, but once enough people had faith that launch was available, off-the-shelf parts were gonna work, things like the PhoneSat project, I think really were inspirational for a bunch of entrepreneurs to say, wait, I can do what with off-the-shelf parts? It actually flies and it, it's been proven that works. A lot of little things that we now take for granted, like frequent reboots to overcome soft errors and things from, from, uh, uh, from you know, the uh, alpha particles and what have you. So, so the, um, the point is just, there was been a wave of the kinds of software-centric startups that you, we normally see, speaking the kinds of language we normally hear around, you know, okay, it's only gonna take a million or two to prove it works, and then maybe 10 million, we can even have a test launch. Those kind of numbers change everything, versus everything times 10, where it's like a Macaw and a Bill Gates who'd say, okay, let's do the billion dollar project, right? And so OneWeb is an example of like one of those multi-billion dollar projects, like $100 million doesn't get them anywhere. Right? They need billion plus to have anything. The minimum efficient scale is a billion. So those sometimes get funding. We came close in that case. Um, I tried to figure out a way to make it look like more like a venture deal, but failed. Uh, and eventually, so it took corporate money. Um, and that will still exist for a different category. But for, for the folk kind of stuff we do, partially constrained by what we do, right? So it doesn't mean it's the only source of capital out there by any means. But for the venture side of this equation, we generally look for those things. Um, and like the projects prior were largely like suborbital tourism, you know, like rail guns. Throughout we've seen, you know, small sat launch vehicles. That's just a steady, like probably 20 or 30 um, a year uh, <laughs> crop up um, until that niche gets filled. And, and I think it's a fairly small niche. Um, so it doesn't mean that there are, I mean, come at it a different way. It doesn't mean that there's 100 proposals that I think are all awesome and want to pursue. But at least there's a handful versus like zero. Uh, this last one? Yeah. yeah. So for software, the unit economics are really good because you don't have to like, have any additional costs to deploy the software. But for hardware, there's much more overhead. So do you think that for hardware, you can still get the massive scale that you can with software? 
shoot, I'm having a real, I don't know why, but I'm having a really hard, I know you're speaking perfectly normally, but somehow the way the thing is going, I couldn't yeah. hear much of that. Maybe if you can repeat it without the mic. Huh? Uh, so for software engineers, I think one of the things that drives me is having you kind of be part of some of the big features and scale and mm -hmm. kind of execute really well. So for hardware people, it's more okay. So do you think that hardware to scale kind of ratio? Gotcha, great. Yeah, software is sort of infinitely scalable hardware, it's the physical thing. So th that's part of the logic behind the dematerialization of value point I was trying to make earlier is that y in many of these businesses, you want some hardware to unlock the software thing, right? So you, in the case of Tesla, you need a car with wheels and a drivetrain and a big screen and a bunch of NVIDIA hardware to unlock all the services in AI and, and autonomous driving capabilities. But in general, you wanna try to minimize that. So in many of the categories I've seen, including let's say robots, I'll, I'll bring up a new one with Rethink and others, you can, it, just by going to commercial off the shelf and then thinking where can I substitute, let's say a feedback loop, or, or in the case of let's say in robotics, where can I trade off precision in a mechanical engineering sense with software feedback loops, and, because you can put a sensor in everything. I didn't mention this, but one of the other key things is not just processors and imagers and memory, it's also all these cheap sensors, all these IMUs, these six axis accelerometers that we take for granted. Um, as a space collector, I have many of these million dollar, at the time, you know, Apollo and Thor and, and a whole bunch of other, I basically have IMUs from the space program. There are all these enormous gyroscopes, right? These two axis gimbals and stuff from the Apollo program. And now you have this little MEMS chip, right? For like less than 40 cents. You've got the equivalent of what was mil millions of dollars before. You could put one of those on every joint, let's say, of a robot arm. And so a simple thing would be, rather than have a you know, really precise motor, electric motor, let's just have the cheapest motors, the cheapest springs, all kinds of horrible, you know, behavior over time where they're gonna sag and change. We're just gonna, like the human body, have feedback loops to compensate for all that change and make it accurate again, at least as bad as accurate as a human is in doing certain tasks. So you still have hardware, but that hardware is dirt cheap. And generally speaking, you wanna uh, leverage what uh, Chris Anderson affectionately called the peace dividend of the cell phone wars. When Apple and Samsung and Apple and, you know, you, who knows who, the new entrant from China, are duking it out. They are beating the living crap out of their supply chain with the you know, incredible volumes that they ship. And so we can all be beneficiaries with all the parts that go on a cell phone. You take, take a cell phone, discombobulate all of its parts, it becomes a Planet Lab satellite, pretty much that's all you need. It can become a robot, just add some really cheap electric motors and, and so forth. So yes, there's hardware, but it's, you know, it's not the reason one company wins over another. It's never the hardware, not never, it's not the hardware going forward. In other words, if, the robot company says we're gonna win because we have a better motor, we just, we just look to the next one, right? It's gotta be because they win because of better software or services. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks. I think that's it, so thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.